So, and with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest today, David Brooke, who's going to talk to us about gratitude. So, you might turn your chairs so you can comfortably see and Mike, would you like? I guess I'll turn it over to David. <coughs> I'm going to give my ticket to Lynette because she never wins. Okay. <laughs> It's always, uh, I'm always thrilled to be invited to speak. Of course, it's also disconcerting when you get up to the mic and the first thing you see is people leaving. So, uh, there's, I'm a member of Seattle Forest, so I know there's always early leavers. So, but before I start, I just want to thank Dave Sam and Pam, and I've seen some old friends here, Chris Long, and of course, Barry Harder, I've known for a number of years. And I spoke here about two and a half years ago, and I looked in my planner, and I couldn't believe it had been that long already. So, I feel very, very blessed to be able to do two or three of these talks a week. Rotaries, chambers, Qantas's, schools, prisons. I get to go to a lot of neat places. So uh, I've got about 15 minutes, so I'm going to be uh, very, very quick. Well, you'd be surprised. There's some pretty interesting people in prison that uh, uh, I think could use some gratitude, too. So uh, let me just start off very, very briefly with by show of hands. How many people here have suffered a significant personal loss in your life? About 90%. As I mentioned, I get to do all the way from commencement speeches at schools where the average age is 18, all the way up to nursing homes. I do a lot of talks there, and that's probably average age 90 to 95. About 100% of the people raise their hands there, and in the schools, it's about half by 18 that have already suffered something. And you've heard several people talk about Robin Williams. I'm going to mention that in a few minutes, too, regarding the depression and some of the things that we all struggle with. So let me just tell you very briefly about my significant personal loss. It was September 29th, 1998. It was a Tuesday. I woke up and I looked in bed, it was 6.30 in the morning and my wife wasn't there. I thought that's very odd, I wonder where Dana is. And just as I'm looking for her, I get up, Connor, my four year old comes in and says, where's mom? I don't know. And so we can't figure it out. Then my 14 year old, Kyle, comes in, same question. So we can't find it, we look in a couple of rooms and we walk down this hallway and we look downstairs and here's Dana down, face down, in front of the washer and dryer and she's all curled up and it doesn't look very good. So we run down there and I turn over and there's stuff coming out of her mouth and it was a very, very tough looking scene. Connor starts crying. I said to Kyle, go call the police, call the fire, get everybody here as quick as you can. And within about five minutes, there must have been 20 or 25 people in our home and they had her laid out in those wires and tubes and those electric paddles and shock and all this kind of thing. It was extremely surrealistic because all I'd ever seen on that before was something like that was in TV. But they worked on her and worked on her and then this little fire person comes over to me and for those of you that raised your hand and know about something like this, one of the things that you'll notice is that time loses all measure. and You kind of lose track of it. And the little fire person says to me, Mr. Brooke, we've been working on your wife for an hour and a half. We still don't have a heartbeat. Do you want us to continue? And even when you're in shock, this CPU up here, this brain still manages to work a little bit. And I thought, that's not good hour and a half and I said no you can stop and she was dead she was 38 years old and what made it particularly challenging for me is that wasn't the first death I had experienced my father had killed himself my mother had passed away when I was younger of cancer friends in Vietnam my sister-in-law a lot of buddies of mine car accidents it was just ridiculous how many people had passed away and within a couple of days of Dana's passing, I walked up to the deck in the back of our house down by Green Lake in Seattle. And I just sort of pinched my skin and I just went, you know what? I don't think I can do this. I'm just a human being, skin and bones and a little, a little bit of hair left. And I thought, you know, now I understand why people kill themselves. And I, thought, I sort of looked out to the sky and I thought about it for five minutes and I thought, nope, I'm not doing that. And so once you make a decision not to do something, in this case, take your own life, it's off the table, so it's not an option anymore. And I've got to raise these two boys. But I also realize that it really does come down to how you look at it. And I notice the fun club. I walk, I drive up, and people are laughing. I think, boy, this is different in Seattle 4. Holy old cow. <laughs> I sit down next to somebody new every week with the five or 600 people and I sit down and I go, hi Bob, I'm Dave Brooke, nice to meet you. A half hour later, I'm still listening to their story and they never ask me about me, which cracks me up. But it's a different kind, it's not a fun club, let me tell you that. <laughs> no offense, Seattle 4, all these rich guys there, these famous people. But anyway, but it depends on how you look at something. So I'd like you to all stand up if you'd be so kind. 
just kind of stretch out after that great breakfast. Thank you, Pam. And I want you to take your right hand, well, there is a clock there, and I want you to start turning it in a clockwise manner like this. Just keep turning. And when I go to the schools, they'd have no idea what clockwise is. I have to like show them. I have to go like this. They go, we're in a digital world. So this is clockwise. So now just keep it stretched out. Now just start bringing it slowly down, slowly, the top of your head, eyes, nose, chin, chest, and waist. Now what direction is it going? Counterclockwise. Counterclockwise. Thank you. Thank you. You can, you can sit down. Look at Steve. This is always my favorite part. Steve is like. Do another trick. Steve is like this. Like. Can we do it again? <laughs> I have these fraternity brothers I went to school with, and I saw them recently, and a couple of them said, "You know, we've seen your little presentation, and frankly, we're not that impressed." And uh, but then one of them says to me, "So how does this work?" Well, I go, well, if you're so frickin' smart, Mr. MBA, Mr. PhD, he goes, well, really, do they change midway? And I go, no, you knucklehead. You're looking at it from a top and below. It's just like the glass. It's my way of saying it depends on how you look at something. I have had a list this long, 20 to 30 people that have passed on in my life, and half of them were of their own hand or something of that nature. Suicide, that's why the Robin Williams thing is so personal to me. Dana died of a prescription pill overdose. She got hooked on Vicodin and Oxycontin and all this crap that's out there now. And couldn't handle it and got arrested once and went into detox and all this kind of stuff and then passed away as I mentioned. But I really feel that in my case, I thought I got to do something so I'm not jumping off that Aurora Bridge. And obviously again, I mentioned the Robin Williams thing a couple of times. Sometimes it just seems overwhelming. And I thought about gratitude once and I thought about how, what happens if you look at your life around gratitude. It's everything you have versus what you don't have. Our world is driven through the media and everywhere else by telling us what we don't have. If I just have this big boat, here we are in the yacht club, if I just have this house, if I, house, if I just have, of course the making out version, I just cracked me up, I just, I just made me laugh. I can think back in high school. We, if I just have that gal, if I can just make out with her. You know, it's just like all those things. If you just, if you just have that, you're going to be successful. So I talk about five things, and I'm going to be very brief because I've just got 15 minutes or so. Embracing gratitude is the first thing. It's a heck of a way to live your life and frame everything on what you have versus what you don't have. The second thing is, is you've got to make room for gratitude and you've got to clear out your brain. As I was mentioning, I think Jim mentioned it too, I came all the way, I actually live in Issaquah. And once in a while I drive around those cul-de-sacs and I go in and there's these three square things next to the houses, I believe they're called garages. <laughs> and yet you see them up and they're just floor to ceiling boxes. And you see the little space in the center and you see the person go like this to get a box. <laughs> and they just, I go, what the, that's for a car. It's not for stuff. But we leave all this stuff in our brain. And when you guys go out there and get in your cars today, pay attention to how big that windshield is. It's about two feet deep, it's about four feet wide, and the rear view mirror is about this big. Mostly pay attention to what's in front of you, learn a little bit from what's behind you. Now if you see flashing blue lights, you have to pull over, you got to pay attention. But mostly pay attention to what's in front of you and get rid of the crud. It's just amazing how much junk that we get in our brains. And again, I think about Winston Churchill, never, ever, ever, ever give up. One of my books, I've done some books and journals, in fact, it's interesting, this is the, the book I push the most, is my gratitude journal, it takes five minutes a day, I'm going to talk about that in just a second. And the quote on the back, David Rook has changed my life by giving me a gratitude moment each and every day of my life. A very enriching feeling that strengthens each day, very harder, for his quote. So I always look at that and I appreciate that. Somebody I, who supported me way back when, earlier, three, four years ago, which I appreciate so much. But you can't give up. Unfortunately, it was too much for Robin Williams and he gave up. I understand that. But there are ways to deal with this that don't necessarily have to do with psychiatrists and pills, and I'm no doctor, but one of them is embracing gratitude. And I talk a lot about, Connor had a really, really tough time when we were growing up, and he, he couldn't make it, and he, he struggled in school, and he struggled in baseball, and struggled in sports. But he finally made it and he finally got through it all and ended up with a 3.5 average and he went from somebody who could never hit a baseball to the leading hitter on the Bothell High School baseball team. But he watched me show him I'm not going to give up under any circumstances. Mom, Dad, Dana, all these different people that have passed on. I'm not giving up. I've got to raise these two boys. They're now 20 and 30. 
Kyle runs a key bank, he's 30, and Connor is in school in San Diego. So it's such an important point. But you also have to remember that what are we really looking for? Somebody talked about Robin Williams on the radio today as I was coming up because I left about quarter to five from Issaquah. And they said he was never happy inside, but he made people happy outside. Tremendous talent, as you've heard several people mention today. When John Lennon was five years old, his mother said to him, I'm going to tell you the most important thing you're ever going to know in your entire life. John Lennon says, what's that? Your number one goal in this life is to be happy. John Lennon remembered that. A few years later, he's in grade school. They're going around the room. And the teacher says, John Lennon, what do you want to be when you grow up? He looks at the teacher and he goes, happy. <laughs> the teacher looks at John Lennon and says, you don't understand the assignment. John Lennon looks back at the teacher and goes, you don't understand life. <laughs> Somehow that doesn't surprise me for John Lennon. But what I realize is if you're going to embrace gratitude and you're going to understand it takes as long as it takes and don't give up, make room for gratitude and clear out your brain, I needed some sort of a tool to deal with it. This buddy of mine had been very, very supportive over the years, says, you know, five years after Dana died, I lost my house, I lost my business because she'd taken all those pills. We were living with a friend, sleeping on a piece of foam. It was pathetic. And I'd been a millionaire when I was 30, flying my own airplane and had all this real estate and stuff and it all gone. So what? You dust yourself off and you get back in the race. But it helps to have tools. And Bob says to me, you're still messed up five years after Dana passed away. I said, Bob, I'm doing the best I can. Building back our money and getting the kids on to school and trying to get to all the practices and Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts and you name it. He says, have you ever heard of a gratitude journal? How many people here have ever heard of a gratitude journal? Well, I'm always surprised. That's a, maybe a quarter of the groups. I had never heard of one. So I get a gratitude journal and I start writing in it five minutes a day is all it takes. And so then I had so much success with it, I did my own. The Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal. And I tell people, especially at Rotaries, I mean, I'm not here to sell a book. If you want to buy this, great, they're $15. I don't care if you get a spiral notebook. It takes five minutes a day. And I must tell you, with all my talks, which are pretty much spontaneous, it was interesting because I've already heard several people say this this morning. I just got a text from a good buddy of mine. What if Robin Williams had met you and kept a gratitude journal? He's got that this morning. I don't know. Again, I'm not a doctor. But when every morning I spend those five minutes and I frame my life around what I have versus what I don't have, it makes such a difference here. So I want to do, again, a very sensitive time because I don't like to go long. But I just want to do a little experiment because what I do in this gratitude journal, this is mine. And on the left hand side it says the day and the date and your daily number. I'll come back to that in a second. And then it has current events and special events. That's just so you don't have to have a diary. And then this is what you're grateful for. The thing at the bottom is the highlight of your day. And then the right hand page here is what you're going to be grateful for. Your gratitude intentions. Your prefrontal cortex houses your subconscious mind and your subconscious mind cannot tell the difference between what you think is happening and what has actually happened. You can program it. I write in it all the time how happy I am and grateful for the successful talk I had at Fidelgo Island or whatever. It happens all the time. But I want you to think about this daily number and I just want to do a little experiment. It's the one experiment I do. I want you to think about a number between 1 and 10 that you are this very moment. 10 is the best day of your life. One is one of the toughest days of your life. I'm hearing about marriages and retirements and uh, Mark's at 72 or 62, I mean. Sorry. Jeez. I know I'm sensitive about these numbers. 64. I'm going to be 65 in three months. And people go, you don't look at day over 63. But it's, uh, it goes by fast. But I want you to think about this is very personal. This isn't looking at your buddy or your wife or anything. It's just you. What is your number right this very moment? Okay? So get that number in your brain, and I want to take a poll of the audience here. So one to five, I don't want you to raise your hand. If you're having a tough day for any reason, I don't want to embarrass anybody. But anybody here is six? Okay, anybody is seven? A few more, eight. Wow, quite a few eights. Nine, quite a few more nines, and any tens? Wow, one, two, three, four, tens, fantastic. Well, here's what I want you to do. I generally have you write this down because it's a little more effective, but I want you to stop and think about the number one thing you're most grateful for. You can only pick one thing. I've heard about marriages, spouses, birthdays, kids, 
kids going in school, or all these different things. I want you to think about the number one thing you're grateful for if you could pick just one thing. Okay? Get that in your brain. Now, the number two thing you're most grateful for. What would that be? And if you're writing them down, number one, number two. Okay, and third and lastly, what was the highlight of your day yesterday? It's 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock this morning, so we're pretty early. But I want you to think about what was the best thing that happened to you yesterday. Okay, now think about those things as best you can. Number one thing I'm grateful for, number two thing I'm grateful for, and the highlight of my day. Okay, now see if your number changes. So let's try again. Any sixes? Sevens. Wow. Eights? Okay, nines? Much more nines. And tens? Tens bumped up about three or four. Thank you, my talk is over now. I just am thrilled when you, and that's just doing it in your head. That is a perfect example of what happens when you write in this gratitude journal. I keep my own, as I said, it, it takes me five minutes. People come up all the time when they're looking at books and telling me their stories and they flip through it and they go, is this yours? And I go, yeah. And they go, wow, you write in it every day. And they go, have you been listening to the presentation? <laughs> I mean, do you just brush your teeth occasionally? I mean, if I know I'm going to feel better after I write in this, why would I not want to write in it every day? Five minutes. So that is why that's so important. I will tell you very quickly on the daily number, this is why the Robin Williams thing is so sensitive to me. My mother was bipolar. She would take pills and she would put them by the phone and shake them and say, I'm going to eat all these pills unless you come and see me right now and I'll be dead by the time you get here when I was in high school before she died. So I think I got some of that stuff from her, which is why, again, the Robin Williams thing was very sensitive to me. I know I got some of that manic depressive crap. And I woke up one day and I was a two. I was so depressed, I thought, I don't even get it. And when they talked about him today on the radio, they said middle-aged men, I'm not sure if it was women, it might have been just middle-aged in general, have a tough time with depression. Life's kind of gone by fast, and we're having these 60-second birthdays and different things that are going on. But I woke up and I knew I was in deep trouble. But I'll be doggone if I'm going to take a pill after what I saw happen to Dana and so many other people. So I went down to Starbucks, took my gratitude journal, wrote in it. Took me five, six minutes, had a coffee. That bumped me up to about a five, maybe a six. I still wasn't quite right. Well, that particular day, this is why I'm so appreciative of Barry, I was doing a talk at the Burlington Chamber. About 150 people. It was a pretty good sized group. And I spoke to them and, and after we were done, a gal came up to me and she's crying. She goes, um, my name is Janice, you just changed my life. And I get that a lot lately, but I hadn't gotten it back then as much. And I said, well Janice, thank you. And she goes, can I give you a hug? And I said, sure. And I said, I'm not so sure I changed your life, but I have a feeling I may have given you some tools and some things to think about to approach this and reframe this maybe a little differently. So she bought a journal and said something about her kids and so forth. And I went out to the car and I got in the car and I realized if you ever wonder who your best friend is, Who's the first person you call when you get really good or really bad news? I think that's one litmus test. And I wanted to call Connor immediately, and then I was going to call Kyle next. But I just sat there and I looked in the rear view mirror and I looked at myself and I realized I was a nine. I'd gone from a two to a four to a five to a nine. Didn't pop a pill, didn't pop a bottle of booze, didn't do some all this crazy ways that people are trying to cope in this crazy world that we have and the stress and the whole thing about when I do the commencement speeches, I talk a lot about this up and down. You know, this is where everybody wants to be. We all go through this. When we're here, we want to stay there. But this is where the lessons are learned down here. So, final thing I want to say. Gratitude journal, I highly recommend it. If you want, again, want to get one of my... By the way, I do a two-minute gratitude video every Monday. Two minutes long on a different subject every week. If you want to get it, you can sign up for it in the little sheet there after I'm done. Last piece is this. Sharing gratitude, just like that person who's your best, your, you talk to when you get the best or worst news. Who's the first person you call? There's something about sharing something that you get excited about that's really, really helpful. So here's what I'd like you to do. How many people here, since I've been talking, I have a feeling this group's going to be pretty good, have been on their smartphone since I've been talking? Nobody. It's incredible. You should see the high schools. They all raise their hands, you know. <laughs> and then I tell them about my gratitude journal, and they go, do you have an app? <laughs> So everybody grab your smartphones. Get your smartphones. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to do something. If you don't have one, that's all right. Those that have them, this is what I'd like you to do. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. This is called four T's. I want you to text, tweet, telephone, or tell somebody how grateful you are to have them in your life. Go. 30 seconds. 
And if you don't have your smartphones with you, just think about who you're going to talk to a little bit later. You guys don't have them, you can be thinking about that. I like this group. There's not as many smartphones as usual. Of course, the kids in 30 seconds knock out about six texts. I've never seen fingers move so fast in my life. And they go, you know, can you give us a little less time? I was, I was bored. I already did six texts. And when it was 30 seconds, gosh. All right, there's 30 seconds. So you guys can finish them later. I will tell you it's quite interesting, though, because I did a talk at the Performing Arts Center the other day, and there's a gal right about where Jim is. And I could hear her. She was actually using this as a telephone, which is quite a unique concept. And she's going, yes, honey, I, I love you. I'm assuming it's her husband. Yes, honey, I love you so much, and I'm, I'm so grateful for you. Yeah, I don't know. Some speaker just told me to call you and tell you I was grateful for you. <laughs> I just went, oh, my goodness. And then somebody else, they come up and they show me afterwards. Look at this one. Yeah, I'm grateful for you, too. What do you want? <laughs> How much money? And then somebody else shows me one that goes, yeah, are you sure you sent this to the right person? <laughs> so it is so important. It's one of the reasons why Dave said thank you so much for coming. I believe Pam said it and, and uh, Jim or, or uh, Chris Long, somebody. I feel so fortunate to be doing this because when you really want to help yourself, the best way to help yourself is to help other people. And I get to do this two or three times a week and I always remember when I understood the concept of not only embracing gratitude, it takes as long as it takes, don't give up, clear out your brain, get a gratitude journal and share it with other people, how important the sharing was. Well, I never did the drugs and all that kind of crazy stuff. I just was fortunate. I never even smoked dope. I think it's ridiculous. But I was an adrenaline guy. So I made an appointment with my fraternity brothers to go skydiving for eight of us on a Saturday. So then on Monday, I get two of them drop out and Tuesday, another one drops out. And then on Wednesday, I get a call, hey, Dave. <coughs> I have a sore throat. I don't know. Good Lord. So I walk up to Issaquah skydiving at 10 o'clock on Saturday and walk up to the counter and I go, hi, Brooke, skydiving? And he goes, uh, yeah, it says party of eight. Where's all your friends? <laughs> I don't have any. <laughs> Nobody showed up. I went by myself and I have a picture jumping out of the plane, but I never got to share that with somebody. I got the picture. But we didn't get to compare notes about wasn't that scary and wasn't that fun. So I encourage you to share it too. For those of you that didn't have your cell phones, send it to those folks later today or at least call them or tell them how much you're grateful for them in your life. It can change your life. It can transform it. And in my case, I feel it saved my life and it can save yours too. Thanks a lot, you guys. Thank you. Certificate appreciation oh, here, and you, our Pam. club gives money to Polio Plus in honor of our guests. So, thank this you, little Pam. purple crocus is uh, signifies that a child has been immunized because they put oh, purple dye on their fingers. So we fantastic. know who's been immunized. So thank you so thank much you. for thank what you, you're Pam. doing, and I think thank you. We all can say that we walked away today with um, some inspiration, and we're going to all go home and give our families a hug, right, and say I love you. So thank you very much. <laughs>